to do that. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the Seattle Software Crafter Meetup. Uh, we meet every month on the fourth Thursday to talk about something different. Uh, we don't talk about things that are technology specific. Uh, instead, what we do is we talk about more how to write better code, how to be better developers, and to enjoy our work more. And some of our topics later this year, including today, start to get a little bit more into some of the joy and the happiness around things. Um, you know, I started my journey no, sort of figuring that out uh, by the book uh, Joy, Inc. and hearing about um, Menlo Industries and how they intentionally try to make a joyful work environment. And of course, working with Ron Cortell, who's all about freeing the human spirit and, and really getting to the soul of things. With me, I'm like, I want to be happy at work. I want to have fun. And it's when I'm writing code, I'm enjoying that. But there's more to it than just writing code and being joyful. And, you know, with that, those those topics are are really what bring us together because code craft is not only just writing excellent and pretty code it's about having fun and doing it sustainably and as we know happiness is part of that and joyfulness uh, martin is a has been attending the seattle software crafter meetup for uh at least this last year that i've seen he reached out to me he's he's one of our our home participants that we always encourage people to come and and give talks as well we are good test bed we're friendly most of the time we're safe unless it's Paige and I giving a talk and then we sort of get into each other a little bit here and there not too bad in a friendly way um but yeah so so it's it's a different different venue and it's an interesting topic that's not directly code related but it's about being effective, an effective developer and an effective person and doing it well sustainably. Um, so Martin, go ahead and hand that off to you. Yeah, all right, thanks. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, it's interesting because the friend who introduced me to Software Crafters, uh, he told me that he realized uh, that the probably the main, the most important factor uh, that makes a good coder is someone who's happy at work. So that made me realize that this, this talk was very um, uh, on point. Um, so I've got a few things I'd like to ask for uh, initially when we start. Um, I like people to have cameras on. Um, I know some of you are eating or whatever, but it's, it's not uh, an obligation, just a suggestion. I just like to see people. I want to make this talk very personal. Um, I'm going to be sharing my story, which is very personal. I'm going to be very vulnerable. Uh, so yeah, I just like to see faces. And uh, the second thing as well is, um, is uh, keeping your attention focused. Um, I know I do that as well. When they're in a meeting, I'll do, I'll text at the same time, whatever. But that is a big thing in my life to be um, very focused on what I do. Uh, so yeah, I just encourage you to, to try at least to do that. <laughs> um, cool. I have one question uh, that I like to start with. And it is... Uh, uh, what is, in your opinion, the one most important ingredient to love your work? So I know there's many things, many ingredients, but I'm just curious to know if you want to put that in the chat. In your opinion, what is the most important thing to that will make you love your work? <clears throat> what comes to mind? Just like, don't think about it too much, just like quickly um i like that yeah try oh yeah lunches with co-workers that's i love that because i um i installed that as well um yeah laughter yeah growth mindset good team i like that cool um my own personal answer is uh freedom so it's the ability to choose not to work um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a, about my story, but that that's made the biggest difference, I think, in the last few years for me to be able to kind of choose not to work if I don't want to. Um, this year, I'm taking six months off. Uh, last year, I took five. The year before, I took four. 
Uh, so I'm kind of <laughs> increasing the time off that I'm taking. And uh, I am in Canada now. I live in Canada. Um, although I've lived in Colombia as well and Mexico and Peru. So that helps me also um, take more time off because life is cheaper there. But um, yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit about my story. Um, I like to start with childhood. Um, my childhood was um, somewhat difficult. Um, I was a very shy guy. Um, I was bullied a lot. And um, people would just like uh, tell me things that didn't know what to answer. If I did answer, people would laugh at me. So, so I kind of built uh, that pain over the years going to school. And when I was 15, um, I even start, started thinking about suicide. Um, I was still very young, I think, to think about that. But it was just like the only way I had to end the suffering. Um, so it was very internalized suffering. Um, and what I did after a month of thinking about that is um, I wrote a letter to my parents. So I told them three things. I told them um, that I was being bullied at school, that I was thinking about suicide, and, and that I'm gay. After the letter, uh, my parents, they came down into my room and we cried all night. It was a big, big emotional night. And um, things from there started getting better because I started opening up more and I started talking about uh, what I was experiencing. Um, and it's very interesting because the coming out process is, um, I think, a process that everybody goes through, not for sexual orientation, but just for anything. If you're an artist, if you're um, whatever, like coming out as being you. And, and that's what I do now in my coaching business. I help people be fully who they are. Um, I help a lot of coaches to start their own coaching business. Um, and, and a lot of people have issues like accepting that idea of being a coach, giving themselves the right to do it, allowing yourself to get money for it, all of that. So it's the same, same steps as any coming out process. Uh, then when I turned 19, I, uh, I fell into depression. Um, and um, yeah, I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. I just quit school. And depression was very, very beneficial for me in my life because um, I allowed everything around me to kind of fall apart and crumble. And what came out of that was the desire to travel. <clears throat> That's all I wanted. That was the only certainty I had in my life. I wanted to travel. And I, I strongly encourage people to do that, to, um, to find these certainties, because people, when they try to figure out what they want to do with their lives, they try to figure out a final answer, like being an architect, architect or software developer or whatever. Just focus on the keywords, what's really important for you. And in my case, it was traveling. So I started traveling. I lived in Scotland for a year. That was an amazing year. I started living. I, I, I keep saying at 19 years old, that's when I started living. Um, and I've kept traveling since. I am uh, 41 now. And I've traveled to 43 countries. Uh, what I like to say as well is that I like to keep the number of countries higher than my age. So I've got, uh, I'm good for now. <laughs> I've lived in 10 different countries. Um, and yeah, I just love to travel. And I've built my life around that, around the desire to travel. I don't, I'm from Canada, as I said. I hate winter. <laughs> so uh, that's what I do. I just like every winter. I've been doing that for the last seven years. Uh, so in the winter, I just go somewhere warm and um and usually i, I come back uh, here in the summer um so yeah um and i worked uh in it for 10 years um because when i was in scotland i worked for ibm first it job uh, it's funny because uh over there they were just desperate for people who spoke uh european languages because there was a call center there and uh, I, I always thought it was very funny because people call IBM and they think they've got like an IT expert. No, you just got someone who speaks your language. <laughs> That's all you have. <laughs> uh, because people, they had like all different backgrounds. Most people came from restaurants. Uh, so no IT background. But that's what started my IT career. And when I came back to Canada, uh, <laughs> uh, when I came back to Canada, I worked in IT as well in hospitals. Um, I never studied IT. Um, and I just worked in hospitals. I was a trainer uh, for nurses and pharmacists, a uh, big company called uh, Cardinal Health, um, American, uh, American company. And, um, and yeah, so I did that for about 10 years. 
And I loved it initially, uh, the first few years, because I was traveling all over Canada. It was the jet set lifestyle. It was all paid for. But in the end, uh, it became a trap. Um, and I was just doing it for the money. So I became very, very unhappy. And what I wanted the most was freedom. I wanted to keep traveling because what I did is I would try, I would work like two or three years. I would quit travel for six months, a year, come back when I ran out of money, try, like work some more, leave again. So I did a lot of that. I quit my jobs uh, many times. <laughs> um, and yeah, and, and my conclusion was that, okay, if I want freedom, I need to have my own business. I need to stop quitting my jobs all the time. So I started my own quit coaching business. Uh, I got into personal development, um, hypnosis, which is a tool that I love. So I trained for it to become a hypnotherapist. And uh, just recently, a month ago, I came back to IT after almost 10 years of, uh, of being with my personal development uh, business. And it's so interesting because I, uh, I do business analysis at the moment. Um, so just, it's not very intensive in IT. It's just like a SQL and, and Excel. But um, it's interesting because I love it. And I realized that um, what, made me, what made it a prison in the past was not the job itself. Uh, it was my mindset. It was, it's what was going through my mind. And now I still see, um, well, no, I, I, now I see that even a traditional job can be a tool for freedom. Uh, freedom doesn't only happen with uh, entrepreneurship. So uh, that's very interesting, I think, to, to have that own, uh, that, that conclusion. <clears throat> um, so that's it. So now I would like to do the first exercise, um, which is uh, we're going to take five minutes. And I'd like you to think about um, what would your life be if you were a multimillionaire? So if you have all the money in the world, no need to work anymore. You've got like you've got more money than you need for the rest of your lives of your life. Um, what do you do? So I've got a few questions. Oh, I forgot the slides. <laughs> so um, I'm going to put a five minute on the clock and um, I've got a few questions here. So just like do it very intuitively. But it comes up naturally. Uh, what do you do with your day? What time do you wake up? Like, be very precise. Just like, um, what do you eat? Who do you see? Who are friends that you see during the day? Um, how do you describe your friendships? So take a few minutes just to think about that life, that ideal life where you don't need money anymore. Also, what do you do for fun? Where do you live? I'm going to put a bit of music here. the questions back up oh i don't know if you can hear the music because i can't oh there we go <laughs> so think about that millionaire lifestyle like you've got all the money that you need what do you do for fun where do you live in what kind of house um do you travel what countries do you do you visit yeah burn all of it yeah <laughs> Where do you travel? Um, how do you find purpose as well in that millionaire lifestyle? Um, because a lot of people, there is a difference between like people think about winning the lottery and there is excitement. There's a few things you do when you have that, but after, what comes after? Do you do any sports? Do you play music? Think about, and, and really don't, actually, I, I keep saying, think about it, but don't. <laughs> I like answers that are just intuitive, like to just come out naturally, even if it doesn't make sense. And if you're, if you're stuck, just write something, right? Keep writing, even if it doesn't make sense. I love those intuitive answers that are not thought about so much. What do you do that excites you in your millionaire life? Do you learn something special? My personal thing is learning languages. I love learning languages. French is my first language. English, my second. Spanish, my third. German is my fourth. Japanese is my fifth. 
I, I, I speak very little Chinese, but <laughs> yeah. So just write what comes to mind. Two more minutes. And try to be very specific, like just take like one day. One day, what time do you wake up in the morning? What do you do? What do you eat? What do you eat for breakfast? Who do you spend your day with? Make it simple, like, yeah. Nice. I like the answers in the chat. one more minute just keep writing usually when you feel that you've written everything or that you said everything that's what comes after that is the most important the most crunchy i love those answers the answers after you're done seeing your answer <laughs> Buy a bigger house and live in the suburbs. So I remember when we were driving, driving in your car. Speed so fast, it felt like I was drunk. City lights lay out before us, and your arm felt nice, wrapped around my shoulder. And I, I, nice. I yeah, home. thank you for sharing the answers I, I, in the chat. I like that. Okay, excellent. So I'd like to uh, take a few answers. Uh, if, if people want to share them live uh, in the video, I love that. Uh, or if, if anybody had trouble with this exercise as well, I can help you. Uh, sometimes people like, like they feel bad because they, they didn't find any answers or not much. And it's normal because it's not, it's not something you think about a lot. <laughs> So uh, yeah, it's, I'm just curious to, to see if anybody would like to share their answers. So what I found really interesting is <clears throat> it was easy for me to think of the much bigger things like own, you know, I'd love to own a boat and travel. I love traveling also, yeah. right? And, and um, I, you know, I want to volunteer and, you know, like my first thought is I want to give away all that money Mm -hmm. in in you know and that sort of thing but it was much harder to think about what am i going to do you know when am i going to wake up and you know what does a day look like as opposed mm -hmm. to a lifetime look like yeah and uh you know it was simpler things for me like like i just want to get up i want to go sit outside and have breakfast of like fresh really good food mm -hmm. and you, you know i want to be around friends Mm -hmm. but well, I, it's, yeah yeah good oh what you're saying is very interesting because um <clears throat> i think a lot of people um well i don't know about like software crafters maybe it's different but i uh a lot of people they're just hoping for the weekend they just want to have time off and they love their vacation whatever but i think it's interesting because when you get it it's very different because as I said, uh, this year I took six months off. Last year I took five. When you have that much time, what do you do? And most people, it's like so outside of their reality that they don't even think about that. But I fell into depression again <laughs> because I just had too much time. My goal was to free up my time, but I fell into depression again because I had too much time. And that is very interesting. So I just had to learn to live really and i still have it it's so interesting because even now like that i started working in a traditional job again on the weekend um if i have time 
available, I think about, oh, I could, I could work. And it's just like, oh, it's crazy. I think that, that that's what comes to mind that, oh, I, I'm bored. I could work. It's just so, so yeah, that's very interesting. But yeah, thank, thank you for sharing. Um, we have, um, I don't see your name, but someone has raised their hand. So if you George. Hand, George, okay. Uh, I'll just say that I want to solve certain technical problems and I can't, I know I can't do it alone with the time I have. Mm. And so I would love to basically be running a nonprofit business that doesn't even have to break even, mm. you know, basically get, get some other people who are excited about coding in certain spaces and make it so they can make a living and just build stuff that doesn't have to make a profit, mm. you know, make it open source and all this jazz and, and, and cause that's the thing I've, I'm full of things that I want to do. And I just, don't have the time to do it. Mm. Right. Interesting. I like that. Um, of course, with this question, with having like the millionaire lifestyle, um, the, the idea is to get the money out of the equation. And a lot of people, they believe that in order to start a project or start a business or whatever, you need money. And in my experience, it's not entirely true. Um, if you really, really are aligned, if you are um uh on purpose uh you're gonna become magnetic you're gonna be like money comes no well i'm gonna say naturally maybe not not 100 percent naturally but money will come to you people will want to join your project if you're really aligned really passionate about something uh so that's interesting i think um <clears throat> And also what's very interesting for this exercise is people who, whose answer is, um, oh, I'm going to invest in real estate. I'm going to invest in whatever. That is interesting because that is not uh, the, like the, the, the goal of the question because you already have too much money. You don't know what to do with all your money because you have so much. So don't think about how you can make more money. Don't think about how you can sustain your life. Um, that means to me, that means that we're still in our rational mind. We're still thinking we're so focused. So we're going to talk, talk about hypnosis later on. So hypnotized into the need to make money. Um, we need to break away from that. And um, so really like I, what I like to ask people in those cases is, okay, if, if real estate was losing money for you for the rest of your life, you knew that you were going to lose money with real estate, would you still do it? Uh, that's a really good question, I think, to, to determine if it, you're doing it for the money or you're not. If you're doing it for the fun of buying things and selling, then yes, keep, keep doing it. That's what you would do like a hobby. We don't expect a hobby to generate money. We, we just spend money on it. That is uh, an error, I believe, <laughs> but that's what, the, how, what, that's what most people do. Um, so that's what I help people figure out. What is that one activity that you would do for free? You should take that, but make money with it. That's the goal, in my opinion. Um, so it takes some like working to do, like you know, like mindset shifting. Um, but yeah, it's it's doable. Um, that's what I do. That's what I do. Um, so yeah, cool. Uh, we had also another hand raised. I don't know why I don't see the names, but um, if you want to, Gary, I, I I had my hand up for a moment, and I'm yeah. kind of taking it back down, but I'll. I'll go ahead and, and get the idea out of my head. Um, uh, one of the uh, one of the personal challenges over the course of this pandemic is that, um, personally speaking, partway through, I hit a really bad point of stress and burnout um, to the point where I really burnt out. Um, I stepped away from a contract that I was involved in, and um, and in in terms of a little personal sharing. Um, I hit a point of depression where um, uh, I was, uh, you know, I needed to talk to a counselor. Um, it was a matter of going on medication. And part of looking back what I need to go through and deal with that, part of the strangest factor of it is I went down to a point of, and I think people have talked about this a little bit, I had to get really bored. And I found myself mm. so burnt out, it took... This will sound a little, it's a little funny and a little sad. It took two months of watching bad teenage vampire dramas on like Netflix and, yeah. you know, like the vampire diaries and, and watching Lucifer and just binging the equivalent of, 
you know, entertainment trash off of streaming services to the point where I was bored with it. And it was just like, okay, you know, that's been done. Everything that, that you know, got to me and broke down from, from that job and everything else, that's mm-hmm. done now. What, what the hell am I going to do? And, and talking with my counselor and saying, okay, what am I going to do? And part of what I did was coming up with a vision for something I might want to build in the future. Mm-hmm. And I did, actually, I started doing a bunch of prototyping work. And then I started thinking, it's like, okay, so I've been, I've been lucky. There's money in the bank, but I need to get myself back into the workforce. And how do I want to do that? And how do I want to come up with a plan for it? But it was the strangest thing because, um, you know, for the longest time, I mean, I, I hit nothing. Um, I lost weight. Um, you know, cause I, I was, I was so bored. I wasn't even necessarily eating so much, which, you know, if folks know me is quite a statement. Um, but it was, it was, it was strange. Um, it was, it was a rough part in my life, but having gone through it now, um, I have, um, a certain amount of empathy for people who, who hit those points. I don't necessarily know that I did before that. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's a, it's a depth. Um, and, and sometimes the best thing that can come out of it is what you learn going through something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing. I I like to give my own personal definition of depression for me. I think it's something very healthy. It's just a normal, uh, mechanism that happens when we don't listen to that inner voice for too long. Uh, there's always like the, a, a voice that wants us to be happy and to do something meaningful is always there. But if we don't listen to it over and over for days and months and years, then it, it, it gets into what I experience as depression or, or even thinking about suicide. And to me, it's that the way I see it is that there's something that wants to come out, like an idea, an impulse, like you want to travel. In my case, that's what it was. Or you want to do something meaningful, whatever it is. But we put pressure on it. We, we don't allow it to come out. And that's what eventually with time, as I said, causes depression. That's my personal uh, definition. But uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And, and, and if we don't listen to that for too long, for long enough, then yeah, it just breaks down. And then that's, that's great because your whole, well, <laughs> not when you're in it, but afterwards, uh, because your whole environment uh, kind of breaks down and then the new you uh, can, can emerge. So um, yeah. Good. All right. Thank you for, for sharing. Um, uh, Trace also had his hand raised and then we'll... Uh, and for a second, I was just going to echo Garrick. Like uh, uh-huh. I similarly had a, a really dark point where I became depressed in the height of the pandemic and mm. nothing was working. And my projects at the time were just toxic. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, I was doing things I didn't know how to do yet and wasn't good at yet. And that may not have been suited to me at the time. And it was just wildly hurtful and painful. I also, through a meditation practice, uh, did it too strongly and kind of in my brain and basically broke and was depressed for a couple months, got in a bike accident, broke my back, I'm totally fine. Um, and uh, then had to, it was basically catatonic and not able to speak at dinner for a couple months. And I kind of had to then come out of it and through that just completely rearranged my work and some things in my life. 10 milligrams of Lexapro helped. And, you know, with a new role that I'm thriving in, I've just been super happy ever since. Mm. So mm, um, I, I do believe that depression, just for, you know, safety's sake, like I am not a therapist and there are some very clinical definitions of it. And there are things chemically that are going on in people's bodies and that for a while were going on in mine situationally and temporarily, however. Um, and so, You know, I find the idea that, you know, that's just, oh, I'm just reinventing myself to be Mm. potentially medically dangerous. So that that was a little, just speaking super Frank Martin, that was a little cringy. Uh, But in terms of, you know, being able to use that to come back from it and redefine things, I do love that and have that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Okay, well, thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah. Um, It's interesting because I think for me, it was a big learning experience of learning to detect the small signs and to take them seriously enough early enough because it, you don't wake up like feeling like totally fine and then wake up one morning and, and it's depression. Uh, it, it, it builds over time. Uh, so yeah, but it's, it's not always easy to act on those little intuitions or the little signs. Uh, so it's, it's, I think it's a matter of yeah, learning to do that. 
So good. All right. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. I really appreciate that. Uh, that's that's what I want my presentation to be. I don't. I just. It's like a conversation. Um, so uh, yeah. Anytime you want to interact or share your answers, I love that. I'm I am impressed by the level of openness that I get in my talks because I I open uh, myself first. I talk about my depression, um, <clears throat> many things. I can talk about my bankruptcy <laughs> a few years ago or or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm very comfortable with all of that. And it, it is interesting because it used to be more shameful. And now that I've realized the like the like the, the benefits it brings me to open up and to share those things. Um, and and uh, it's, it's magical because when I do, other people open up as well. And I, I don't even ask for it. It just happens naturally. So, um, so yeah. Good. All right. We are going to do another exercise, which I love. Uh, these are my two main coaching exercises. So the millionaire lifestyle. Oh, before we, we go to the second one, uh, what I like to do is, um, so now you've done it because we're a group. So you've all done it individually. But what I love to do is to do, to do it one-on-one -on -one because the answers that came out, uh, they're usually like um, rational answers. Um, and it was when I was talking about earlier before we started, was that the most important answers, they're not rational, they're not verbal. Um, so you can say, for example, in my millionaire life, oh, I would love to own a big house and I'd love to play guitar. Well, you can see that having a house and playing guitar is not the same nonverbal. It's not the same emotions. So this is what we need to get at. Uh, but that's very, very difficult to do on your own. Even myself, I need people to help me to give this, give me this feedback. Um, so if you want to do this exercise with me, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. You can contact me and I'll, uh, we can do it uh, after this talk. Um, all right. So next exercise, second one, uh, which I love is um, what would you do if you only, only had one month to live? So you learn that today you only have one month left on earth. What do you do with that month? Um, I'm going to give you three minutes for this one. There we go. So just, um, again, just write what comes to mind naturally. Uh, do you continue working? That's a really good <laughs> indicator whether you like your job or not. <laughs> um, what do you, um, oh yeah, figure out what to, how to live one extra day. I like that. <laughs> um, so who do you see? What do you need to do in that last month that you haven't done yet? What do you feel the urge to do now? Now that the time is counted, um, who do you talk to? Where do you spend that last month? So just think about that. It comes up naturally. So I've got here that answer, Eric. I love my job in coworkers, but I'd stop working. Yeah, I'm the same. <laughs> Well, what's interesting is I would stop my um, IT job. I would still give talks like these. Um, so that's that's an interesting difference, I think. So yeah. So think about that last month all that you want to do. One more minute. So what do you do with your last month? Seconds. 
oh, take a weekly psychedelic trip. I like that answer. <laughs> I would be, <laughs> I would be part of my answer as well. <laughs> Okay, good. I am curious to hear some of the answers if some people want to share, whether you have good answers or you don't. If you don't, that's fine too. Uh, I'm going to put my LinkedIn in the chat mm -hmm. uh, because someone took the class. So here. Martin, <clears throat> I, I would definitely quit my job. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoy the people I work with, but if I have a month to live, I would quit my job and I would spend it with friends and family. I, mm -hmm. I would, uh, yeah, to go back to the conversation that we had at the very beginning, uh, I would find a way to book a trip for me, my partner, and my two sons mm -hmm. to go on a two-week trip down the Grand Canyon. Mm, nice, nice. Excellent, thank you. Anybody else wants to share? <laughs> or anybody had trouble? Yeah, Garrick. <laughs> it's kind of funny, um, especially because I haven't done it. I'd actually mm. bother to write a will. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I hate to point this out, I, you know, it may be fatalistic, but uh, uh, statistically, I think everyone in this talk will need one someday. <laughs> I mm. think that's a safe bet. Yeah. Um, how many of us actually think to sit down and write it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All Good right. for you, Good Michaela. <laughs> well, the problem is I've clear cleared out three people who were intestate over the last five years, and mm. I will never do that to another human being in my life. <laughs> mm. Oh, I love Paige's answer. I like, try to think things that interest me but makes me scared. Um, that is that is so interesting because um, yeah, it's one of the things that this question can bring up. Um, we, we're scared of things like oh, for example, like doing this presentation. It's funny. A lot of people when I became a speaker, a lot of people said, "Oh wow, it's amazing. You're not scared." You well, no, I am. <laughs> I still do it. <laughs> so really, it's learning to um, <clears throat> quiet down that inner voice um, and not listen to the fear as much but it's still there, it will remain there. Uh, but if you still act, you, you listen to that voice less and less and it loses power over you, but the fear is still there. I'm still afraid of many things. <laughs> I just learned to do it anyways. Uh, it's a learning a learning uh, experience, but um, yeah, so um, it, yeah. It's really interesting and, and actually Michaela, you kind of, with the, with the micro dosing thing. Massage. It, 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 like, you know, I like, I'd love to zip line, but oh my God, does that freak me out a lot? Mm. Like, but you know, it's that sort of like, why wouldn't I? What? Mm. And, and then you, then the question is, why don't I now? Right. Mm -hmm. What, you know, is that the, is that, is, is the possibility of death or the, the, you know, is that really what's stopping me now? And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that is, that is very interesting because I, actually after that question, the homework for all of you is to take not one month, but usually I suggest like one year, <laughs> give yourself one year and try to do what's on your list uh, because we don't know. We don't know how long we have to live. Um, and that's, I think, what made me, gave me a very good life, a life that I enjoy is that I, I do ask myself these questions and I act on them. Um, I, I said, uh, I don't like winter, Canadian winter. A lot of people don't, but very few people take action to, uh, to do something about it. So that's, I think a big difference with me. I, I act on, on, on things and it's, um, it's a learning process. I mean, I didn't decide one day, oh yeah, now no winters anymore. It took me a few years to build that lifestyle. Uh, but I just ask myself the questions uh, over and over. And these exercises, uh, you can do them every year, every few months. Um, and because the answers will change, they will get more precise. Um, as I said, somebody, many people, when I ask them, like, what would they do if they were a millionaire? Uh, they don't know. They don't know. And that's fine, because maybe it's the first time you're asking yourself that question. 
Um, so just do it the best you can now. Do it again in six months and in six months and, and, and it will build and develop and get more precise over time. So, um, so yeah. Um, yeah, fear is very interesting. Um, yeah, I've just learned to um, gradually stop listening to it uh, because, yeah, that's what holds us back uh, from. And I think there's um, a tale, it's in French, but I, I love it. It's the magician of fears. And uh, it says that behind every fear, there's a desire. And behind every desire, there is a fear. That's just how things work. Um, so the things you fear the most are probably the things you need to do the most and that you have more desire for. Otherwise, you're not afraid of them. You're just more indifferent. Uh, you don't care about it so much. But if you're afraid of something, it probably tells that there is something inside of you that wants to do this, that wants to, that needs to be fulfilled doing that. So that's interesting. I, that's a question that I love as to, to ask myself. What would I do if I had no fears at all? Um, and then I, I try to do it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's a very powerful question that I like to ask myself. Um, one, all right. Anybody else wants to share? I, I just or? had one little follow up that, that was interesting to me is that there were several things on the list I'm making in, in you know, notes that were sort of crossovers with this. And a lot of it was, you know, like, like if I had millions of dollars and didn't have to worry about money, mm -hmm. I'd spend a lot more time with friends and community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and if I only had a month to live, that also went on the list, mm -hmm. spend much more time with friends and community. And, you know, the thought of like, oh, well, maybe there's something there that it's on both lists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, I love what you're saying, because yeah, that's very powerful. That's what you need to find. Uh, when you have something that comes up uh, more than once and if you do it also over time, because I change my mind all the time, or I used to, not, not as bad as, as it was before, but I did this exercise and then three months later, it would be completely different. And then three months later, it would be completely different. So what I did is over time, I, I paid attention to what is always there. Traveling for me has been there for 20 years. So then that tells me, okay, I need to be <laughs> more attentive to this. Uh, but most things, they're just like, they're just like a phase and, and it just lasts a few months. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I forgot what else I was going to say, but uh, yeah, yeah, this, it's great. So just do it. Um, and actually, it's amazing the number of people uh, who just work four days a week. I did that 20 years ago. I, it's funny, when I was like just in my early 20s, I said I was in pre-retirement. And, uh, and yeah, it's amazing the number of employers who are, uh, who would allow that. Uh, just my, my current job now, they don't care. They just like, I could work four days a week and yes, you get paid a little less, but to me, life is just about living more than working. So, um, so yeah, prepare for retirement when you're 20, <laughs> not only with saving money, but also living that lifestyle. Um, that is all those small things that I did over the last 20 years that allowed me to have this lifestyle that I have now. So, um, yeah, yeah. If it came up twice in your answers, then yeah, start doing it. That's, uh, as I said, the homework that comes with this exercise. It's <laughs> take action, start taking action on, on these answers. Uh, make to pick one, maybe pick one. I like when things are simple, easy to act on. So pick one and pick a date ideally and decide that okay by next month that date i'm gonna go skydiving or whatever so um yeah cool all right excellent so um i'd like to move on to my next topic which i love which is hypnosis and dehypnotizing yourself um it's funny because i like to say more and more now that i don't do hypnosis i do Dehypnosis. So I help people dehypnotize themselves, um, and I like to explain what hypnosis is for me because for most people, the idea that they have is the the shows. Like you, you get get hypnotized. You you do the chicken on stage, and yeah, that is also hypnosis. Uh, that's some techniques that I don't even know how to do. I kind of know how it works, but I, I couldn't do them because I haven't practiced those exercises. But what I do is, is therapeutic uh, hypnosis. And I think that everybody on this call and in life in general is already hypnotized. To me, hypnosis is that inner voice we have inside of us that tells us 
um, as I said, like, oh, public speaking is scary or whatever. And then whenever you repeat something over and over, that is hypnosis. It becomes conditioned. Um, so, and that will show in your life, uh, that will show whether the results are positive or negative. It's probably the result of repeated thoughts over that topic. Um, so if the thoughts are negative, it's usually going to give, uh, negative results. So what you need to do is become aware of those thoughts and, um, and change them. <clears throat> so for that, uh, I love meditation. Meditation has helped me a lot. I have done 10 meditation retreats of 10 days in silence. Uh, so hundred days total. That was awesome. It's no, no, uh, very difficult, very challenging, but also incredible. Uh, so it's funny when I come out of those retreats, people ask me how it went and it's just like hell, <laughs> but paradise as well. So, um, so yeah, but we're not going to do 10 days of silence uh, today. Um, but I have a, a quick exercise that we can do um, that I like to guide you through for people that want to try it. Um, and um, yeah, so we'll just do that now. So it's about only like five, 10 minutes. Um, and um, yeah, we'll just um, do a quick meditation. And um, yeah, let's go. All right. So we can uh, close our eyes and uh, connect with the breath. And you can feel the air coming in, going out. And you can try to lower your breath into your lower belly. And let your whole body relax with your shoulders becoming heavier. With your jaw relaxing and your whole body just becomes heavier and heavier, more relaxed. And as your body gets heavier, there's also a part of you that becomes lighter as if you could float. And there is a part of you that remains very heavy sitting down and another part that gets lighter and lighter and flies up into the sky even into the atmosphere and you can fly higher and higher up to a point where you can see the whole planet earth so you're there in space very peaceful very quiet and you can see the entire planet earth and after a while you come down and as you come down you realize that 10 years have passed we're now 10 years later and you go down towards the earth And as you go down, you can meet your 10 years older self. So you can see yourself 10 years older. You can look at that person, his or her posture, the face. You can look at your own self and your energy, see what emanates from you. And you can even start a conversation with that person. You can ask him or her how he's doing. And your 10 year old self can answer that they are doing very very good and you can feel it in their answer feel it in their smile in their energy and you can even ask other questions like how did you get there how did you get to that state 10 years later 
and you can listen to the answer. You can also ask, what is that person's best advice for you now? What is the advice of your 10 years older self for you now? And you listen to the answer. You can ask other questions if you want to, to that older self. And after a while, you can even walk to that person and take him or her in your arms to hug her or him. Hold that person in your arms, feel their energy, and you can even merge with that person with the 10, 10 years older self stepping inside you. And you can feel that person inside of you with his or her energy. You can feel inside of you, you have that person, your 10 year old self into your chest, in your belly. You can feel the effects of having that 10 years older self inside of you. You can scan your body. Maybe there's different feelings in your boot, in your body, maybe there's movement or heat or cold or nothing at all. And you can slowly come back here. Let your body wake up gently and whenever you're ready, you can open up your eyes. All right, <laughs> excellent. I, I love to do this exercise because um, I think if we can feel that feeling of the person we want to become, um, then it's easier to get there. The mind automatically knows it's got a, a clearer objective. Um, so I like to take that time every day, take a few minutes to just sit down could just be like a breathing exercise um, or, or this exercise, or I've got many others um, that, yeah, you just go towards that uh, millionaire life, go towards that better self, that um, higher self that guides you naturally, intuitively. And the more you become aware of it, um, the easier it gets. Um, and so, as I said, that's probably the one of the main tools that led me to live the life that I want. It's, it's that. It's to think about it, but also to act on it. And acting, for me, is doing this. Um, because we're so caught up in the spiral, uh, constant cycle of thoughts. We need to create a space, a, a break into those thoughts to kind of because I feel like the way I see it is kind of drowning into your own thoughts. And it's interesting because a lot of people when they start meditation, when I started meditation, I thought the goal was to stop all the flow, constant flow of thoughts. And for me, it was the opposite. It was when I sat down to, to meditate, it was just, oh my God, there were so many thoughts. It was just crazy. It was worse. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't worse. In fact, it was just that I was aware for the first time of the craziness of my thoughts. Um, but that could feel discouraging for a lot of people. 
So the goal is not to stop the thoughts. Uh, it is ultimately to become enlightened, but that's, <laughs> that's a goal for uh, another life. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just to become aware of the thoughts, just to realize, oh, I'm thinking about this. Oh, I, I, I'm thinking about this. And to disconnect the thoughts from one another to slowly regain power over them. So that's, that's more how I see it. Um, so I'm curious to see if there's any reactions, any, anybody who wants to add thing or questions. Um, sometimes I, um, I've, I've done this exercise and it's, it's rather simple, I would say, but it can stir up uh, big emotions uh, sometimes. So if you want to share again, uh, whether it's with the group or just if you want to write me individually, that's fine too. Um, so yeah, anybody wants to share on that? I always love taking a self-hypnosis break in the middle of the day. Mm. Um, the, the taking the time to, to focus on something. Um, <clears throat> again, what you say, the distractions come. It's, it's about acknowledging those distractions and letting them go. Mm -hmm. uh, and giving them respect, say thank you. It's like Marie Kondo. Mm. Thank you for your value, but not right now. Mm. I'm focusing on this. Mm -hmm. um and then the coming out of it and when i'm when i'm doing my meditations i'm doing it closed and i open my eyes and the world seems brighter and crisper mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i love that yeah yeah i, I said it initially uh when we started this um uh, this meeting that i try to train my mind to focus on one thing at a time and i strongly believe against multitasking. I think multitasking is horrible, in my personal opinion. Um, I like to be very focused on one thing at a time. And I always, like on my phone, I've got no notifications on my computer as well. I don't like notifications at all. I like to be in control of when I give my attention to my emails or, or messages or whatever. So, uh, yeah, but it's, it's, it's getting, I think, more and more difficult. I see the difference because 20 years ago, I used to enjoy reading a book for like three, four hours I could do. Now I do 20 minutes and I feel like <laughs> I'm bored. It's just like, wow, that's crazy. So I'm training my mind to go back to that state, um, not because it's, it's, it's fun or easy, just because it gives me a lot more um, happiness in life, like to be content of just sitting down, doing nothing. That is, I, I love to do this more and more, but it's a challenge, it's a challenge, and yeah. <laughs> uh, going back to the single focus, as you were describing floating in the air, I was standing during that. I mm -hmm. do not recommend standing during that. I started to like <laughs> lose my balance, was starting to fall. Right, <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, um, good point. And that was interesting, because I've never, I've never stood while yeah, meditated mm. and I realized that even bodily functions mm. attract, you know, use so much attention and going into that deep state. Yeah. I was literally like, I could feel myself going like this. It was wild. Mm. Maybe try it once, but, you know, make sure you have some cushions nearby in case you yes. to topple over. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, there, there's been a few comments about psychedelics. And what I like to do is a breath work, like very intense breath work, like hyperventilating myself. And I love the effects of standing up uh, because it's stronger, but yeah, dangerous as well because <laughs> I've fainted a few times. So not <laughs> recommended, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I like to do these exercises uh, standing up because it gives more freedom to the body to, to move. And um, yeah, I do tend to feel them more when I'm standing okay. up. So uh, yeah, but yeah, you gotta be careful about uh, yeah, falling or whatever. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it was it was just a it was a sway and maybe your mm -hmm. definition yeah. of it drowning in thoughts kind of mm. is the the wave of thoughts kind of mm. taken over it yeah. was kind of me like rocking on a ship. It, mm -hmm. it was interesting. Now that I've trained as a hypnotherapist, I'm so careful about the words that I use because if I say something, even as a, even as a joke, even if, just what you're saying, like drowning in thoughts, I never thought of that. But but yeah, like it could be some people could react like a lot to that so yeah thank you thank you for that yeah cool all right um i don't know if there's any more uh questions or people who want to share 
otherwise, um, there is um, many more stories that I can share. <laughs> uh, I skipped one. I'm not used to using a PowerPoint. Like when I give my talks, usually it's more in person and I, I don't like PowerPoint so much. Uh, but um, there is this, like the few stories that I like to share. This one, uh, the, 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 the four points at the bottom, uh, flying back and forth to Paris for a cup of coffee. <laughs> I just thought of that. And I love that story because uh, a lot of people, it was very impactful for them. So I'll just share it. Um, it's about like 10 years ago. I, I bought a flight. I, I was in Quebec City. So Canada, Quebec. I bought a flight from Quebec to Paris, had coffee and came back. Uh, that was the most one of the most insane things I've ever done in my life. And it was so amazing. Like the experience that I created for myself, I was so excited. I felt so rich. Uh, when I talk about the millionaire lifestyle, that's what it is, like flying to Paris for a cup of coffee. And um, and I'm not going to do it again <laughs> because that's a lot of flying for, for coffee. But, uh, but it's amazing because it's the experience that I created – inside of me with my own mindset with my thoughts and i was always thinking about maybe the person sitting next to me is going to paris for business and they they don't want to and they they're, they hate it or whatever um so that is so interesting because it's not about the actions that we do it's about uh, the mindset and um it's really like the experience that you create for yourself and this applies also for work for anything work can be so boring and it can be so exciting, but it's the same job. It's not the tasks themselves. Um, I, I said it like for me, 10 years ago, a traditional job was a prison. That's the metaphor that I had linked. I had linked work and prison together. Uh, I've got an ex-boyfriend. It's the same for him. Uh, it was the, a couple. A couple for him was a prison. Uh, so, so sometimes we link things together and that's also part of the hypnosis concept. So it's linking and unlinking things, but, uh, but yeah, just know that you can do that. It's doable. Uh, you can, you may be, well, we've all, we've all do it. We've all done it. So yeah, having that new meaning for a traditional job that used to be prison. Now it's freedom. <laughs> uh, it could be that extreme. Um, so, so yeah. I'd just like to share that story of mm -hmm. going to co to Paris for coffee. Nice. That's it. Um, as I said, I've got more stories to share, but I mean, it's uh, <laughs> that's my exercises. That's like, like what you had is like an, an intense hour of coaching. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's what I usually do. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Questions? Yeah. George? Uh, it's more of a comment on your last one. Do we live mm. in a simulation? <laughs> I, I love that, I'm yeah. pretty sure that the quantum uh, spooky action at a distance is a software bug. Mm -hmm. And and the reason I say that is that the best way to fix a bug like that would be to have it collapse quicker and quicker the more qubits you add. Mm. Because you can't take it away once once the puny simulants have discovered it, mm -hmm. but you can make it effectively almost useless. Um, so yeah, that's why to me, quantum quantum uh, entanglement is a is a perfect uh, scenario for the f us living in a simulation. Mm. Mm -hmm. I like that. My, my favorite movie of all times is the Matrix, uh, all four, <laughs> even the last one. I know people didn't like it as much, but I, I loved it. So uh, yeah, it's um, it, and it's part also of I think my happiness because um, taking things. Oh yeah, um, I, I I forgot I went quickly in my slides initially, but um, I, I like to talk about the purpose of life. Like people is a big question for a lot of people, and I, I wrote there. <clears throat> Don't worry, there is no purpose. <laughs> Don't get uh, hung up over it. There's, there's no purpose to this. That's what I believe now. I think um, it, the purpose of life is the same purpose as playing a video game or same as listening to music or whatever. It's just like, the, it's just like playing. It's, that's what it is. Uh, it's very interesting, actually, also the use of words. I love that. Like to, we play a video game, we, we play music, uh, an actor plays. Uh, I think we are all actors as well who play a role in this life. 
And uh, well, maybe a lot of people have forgotten that they're playing. Oh, kids do it. Kids do it intuitively. Like they, they do it, like they just play. That's how they discover life. Um, so yeah, that's what I want. I want, I want to play with my life. I want to enjoy it. And I want to bring as many people into my game <laughs> so that people enjoy their lives too. Um, yeah. And, and a good way of doing that is to becoming disconnected from, if you're like, what I like to say is if you're watching a movie that close, um, for a long period of time, you, you believe that you are the movie. So if it's a horror movie, it's a scary movie, whatever you you're living it firsthand experience. What you got to do is get, create some distance, uh, and to watch the movie again and, and realize you're watching a movie, then you can just enjoy it without being involved so much in the first in the first experience um so yeah that's the goal and and meditation all those things becoming observing your thoughts all that's what it, it allows you to do you become aware that you're watching a movie you're watching your life and you're enjoying it instead of like uh living it firsthand yeah garrick nice. oh i was just um uh going to uh, point to if people hadn't noticed my favorite quote from Kurt Vonnegut that I threw into the chat. Oh, yeah. I tell you we are put on earth to fart around and don't let anyone tell you any different. Hmm. <laughs> Although I usually like to uh, I usually like to misapply that with um, a bit from the Princess Bride in which I mash up Vonnegut and um, uh, and Wesley and say that I tell you we're put on nurse to fur it around and anyone else tells you otherwise is selling something, your highness. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 The, the discussion about the living in a simulation, I think is an interesting one. I don't, I don't know that we are. I don't, well, as I said uh, earlier, I, the, the older I get, the least I know. So I don't know anything. I'm just good at asking questions. Um, that's what I like to do. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, we, we kind of mentioned, or you mentioned this at the beginning, but like, how do we wrap this back around to, to being happy and making our team, uh, I, I guess we can't make our team happy, but mm -hmm. becoming a, a, a happier at work and you know, I personally, I'd love to be able to spread that happiness to my team mm -hmm. if there's a if there's a way to do that. Because again, I can't make them, but you know, how does like I, I love this stuff. How do I apply it? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, I think, as you said, like being the example is the best thing uh, we all can do. Um, so yeah, and um, doing these exercises, living your own best life, um, and People, I mean, it's not about telling people that I'm happy. I don't think I, I could be very depressed and still tell people I'm happy. It's about feeling. And I think there is, um, we all have that intuitive feeling. We know, we feel it if someone's being honest or not. Um, so it's really like just living what you want. That's the, the millionaire life that we did, that exercise. So like, I'm not there yet. Um, I'm, my goal is just to get closer and closer to it. Um, so that's what I do. And, and it's interesting because as I said, it, I, I thought it was like more of a linear path that, oh, from like traditional job to uh, entrepreneur, I'm, I'm improving my life, but now I'm going back to like traditional job with a different mindset. And now it's giving me what I want. So, um, so yeah, I think that's the best you can do. Um, people like will be naturally interested in your life or in what you do um, um, if they feel that you are happy. Uh, mm -hmm. I did that when, when I worked my last IT job uh, 10 years ago, uh, everybody had lunch in front of their computers. And I said, no, <laughs> I'm not. We're, we're, we're all going out. It's very nice in the summer. So we're all having, and people loved it. And, um, and yeah, I think that's, I brought a lot of that to the workplace. Um, yeah, by t taking those actions that kind of everybody knows how, like what to do, but not a lot of people, uh, have the guts of doing it. So I think that that's what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I add on to that? Maybe some mm -hmm. thoughts. Yeah, One of the things I like to model the behaviors. So for being able to take some time and, you know, 
take a quick meditation break if you're pairing or you're mobbing and, and have the group do that during, during oh, your okay. Pomodoro break. The other thing is, and working with Industrial Logic and Modern Agile and a plug, uh, Tara Scott's going to talk in October about uh, psychological safety, creating a safe space um, and, and allowing that to happen. I don't, mm. so one of the things that, that happened at the beginning of this year I was working with a team that was in Ukraine and they were apologetic. They're in leave. They were apologetic because they had to go into the basement because they were being bombed. I'm hmm. like, don't be apologetic. Close the laptop and go. I don't care. Yeah. Um, I've had to kick people out of offices because, oh, my dad had a heart attack and I'm plop their laptop closed. And I say, you get out of here right now. Hmm. It's creating a space that allows people to be safe mm. and joy and happiness can come from that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I even do it like I've got, I'm on a new contract now. It's all remote. Uh, so I know like the remote context is also more difficult, uh, mm. especially for the social interactions, but I, I still do it in the chat box in teams. Um, I talk about my own weekend. I've sent people pictures of my boyfriend. And it's not something people <laughs> are used to, like, because if I only leave it to my coworkers, they're very work oriented. But I bring that like um, personal touch and people appreciate because now people ask me about my weekend, too. And it's just, oh, OK, all right. So I am creating what I want to see more in the workplace. Um, so, yeah, do it. If you feel mm -hmm. like it, do it. Mm -hmm. Derek, you still had uh, your hand up. I don't know if it's from last time or. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's a big thing. I think take it like if you see things, um, do it. Um, I, I used to work in, in environments like in the government in IT, and everybody knew things didn't work or things didn't make sense or whatever. But nobody or almost nobody makes like do, does something about it. So it's just like no, <laughs> no. If you see something that doesn't make sense, just like bring it up or raise it and even mm -hmm. if you're gonna know like my boss i was told like oh yeah we, we asked about that like a few months ago but we were told no and i said okay well, well why no like does she know the implications does she know we're wasting like 500 dollars a week on this mm -hmm. um and and when i showed the numbers my boss said yes of course yeah because nobody cares to go further than the no so yeah yeah Awesome. It seems like um, I like to say the popcorn has maybe stopped mm -hmm. popping. Yeah. Uh, I would like to thank you very, very much, Martin, for coming and talking to us today. It, it was mm -hmm. amazing. Thank you. Um, I, I enjoyed your stories mm -hmm. uh, and the insights that it's brought for me um, and the reminder for some meditation during the day, too. Mm -hmm. totally. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Um, I would like to also sort of wrap this up. Next week we have Dustin uh, Thostenson, or Thostson, uh coming to talk to us about if you're fighting, you're failing. Um, he's an industrial logical industrial logic coach, um, and then we do have a speaker that I believe we have lined up for um, September but I haven't confirmed it. And certainly October, uh, Tara is gonna be talking. And yeah, other than that, everyone have a great day, fantastic day. And we will see you next Thursday, or next month on the fourth Thursday, 10 o'clock Pacific. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much.